This is Electric Universe Eyes, and today I'm going to narrate from the book Stargazers and Grave Diggers, written by Emanuel Velikovsky. File 3, page 276. Before the Chair of Jupiter. On November 8th, 1953, we were invited by Einstein to visit with him. The story of my relations and debates with Albert Einstein, from the first reading of the manuscript of Worlds in Collision until his death, is related in a separate book, Before the Day Breaks. On that evening, he greeted my wife and me, his long hair well-groomed, his face lighted with a friendly smile, and started to move a chair with a very high back, which had already drawn my attention in the modestly furnished living room. As I helped him, he said, this is my Jupiter chair. During our conversation, I took this lead and remarked, if one evening I should stop every passing student and professor on the campus and should ask, which of the stars is Jupiter? Is it possible that not even one would be able to point to the planet? How is it then that Jupiter was the highest deity in Rome, and likewise Zeus in Greece, Marduk in Babylonia, Amon in Egypt, and Mazda in Persia? All of them represented the planet Jupiter. Would you know why this planet was worshipped by the peoples of antiquity and its name was in the mouth of everyone? Its movement is not spectacular. Once in twelve years it circles the sky. It is a brilliant planet, but it does not dominate the heavens. Yet Apollo, the sun, the dispenser of light and warmth, was only a secondary deity. After explaining that Marduk was the Babylonian name of the planet Jupiter and Mazda its Persian name, Einstein expressed his wonder. Then I told him that in the Iliad, it is said that Zeus can pull all the other gods and the earth with his chain, being stronger than all of them together, and that an old commentary by Eustathius, a Byzantine scholar, states that this means the planet Jupiter is stronger in its pull than all the other planets combined, the earth included. Einstein admitted that it was really very strange that the ancients should have known this when after three quarters of an hour during which we were served tea, we rose to go. Einstein kept us, saying, we have only started. In order not to appear a bore or a fanatic of one idea, I repeatedly changed the theme of conversation, as is so easy with Einstein, whose associations are rich and whose interests are many. The conversation was vivid. We spoke again of the problem of time, which apparently occupied his mind then and of coincidence and accident. He observed that it was an accident of unusual rarity that his chair should occupy its very position in space, but that it was no accident that we two were sitting together because meshugun, Hebrew for crazy people, are attracted to one another. In the following weeks, I put my lecture before the Princeton Graduate Forum in writing and discussed it with Professor Motz of Columbia University. Then I sent a copy of it to Einstein. After a few days, he invited Elisheva and me to come and discuss it. The problem he selected for discussion that evening from a series of problems mentioned in my lecture was the round shape of the sun. Because of rotation, it should be somewhat flattened, and in addition, the sun rotates at a greater velocity at its equator than at higher latitudes. We spent the evening talking about this and a few other points in my lecture. In the morning, I thought of calling Helen Dukas, Einstein's secretary, to say a few words of apology for our too long conversation. When the phone rang and Miss Dukas said, the professor would like to talk to you. His voice sounded resonant and clear and I thought, if one does not see Einstein but only hears him, he might imagine that he's speaking with a young man. Einstein said, after our conversation last night, I could not fall asleep. For the greater part of the night, I turned over in my mind the problem of the spherical form of the sun. Then before morning, I put on the light and calculated the form the sun must have under the influence of rotation, and I would like to report to you. I mention this episode only to emphasize Einstein's attitude toward a scientific problem that intrigued him, and even more, his behavior toward a fellow man.